October 30th, 1937. Today, during the religious ceremonies taking place during Mass and the second day of Thanksgiving, I saw the Lord Jesus in great beauty, and He said to me, My daughter, I have not released you from taking action. I answered, Lord, my hand is too feeble for such work. Yes, I know, but joined with my right hand, you will accomplish everything. Nevertheless, be obedient. Be obedient to the confessors. I will give them light on how to direct you. Lord, I already wanted to begin the work in your name, but Father S. keeps putting me off. Jesus answered me, I know this, so do just what is within your power, but you must never withdraw your efforts. November 1st, 1937. After Vespers today, there was a procession to the cemetery. I could not go, because I was on duty at the gate. But that did not stop me at all from praying for the souls. As the procession was returning from the cemetery to the chapel, my soul felt the presence of many souls. I understood the great justice of God, how each one had to pay off the debt to the last cent. The Lord gave me an occasion to practice patience through a particular person with whom I have to carry out a certain task. She is slower than anyone I have ever seen. One has to arm oneself with great patience to listen to her tedious talk. November 5th. This morning, five unemployed men came to the gate and insisted on being let in. When Sister N had argued with them for quite a while, could not make them go away, she then came to the chapel to find Mother Irene, who told me to go. When I was still a good way from the gate, I could hear them banging loudly. At first, I was overcome with doubt and fear. I did not know whether to open the gate or, like Sister N, to answer them through the little window. But suddenly I heard a voice in my soul saying, Go and open the gate and talk to them as sweetly as you talk to me. I opened the gate at once and approached the most menacing of them and began to speak to them with such sweetness and calm that they did not know what to do with themselves. And they too began to speak gently and said, well, it's too bad that the convent can give us work, and they went away peacefully. I felt clearly that Jesus, whom I had received in Holy Communion just an hour before, had worked in their hearts through me. Oh, how good it is to act under God's inspiration. I felt worse today, and I went to Mother Superior, intending to ask her permission to go to bed. However, before I could ask for permission, Mother Superior said to me, Sister, you must somehow manage by yourself at the gate because I am taking the girl to work at the cabbage since there is no one else for the cabbage. I said good and left the room. When I got to the gate, I felt unusually strong and I was at my post all day and felt well. I experienced the power of holy obedience November 10th, 1937. When Mother Irene showed me the booklet with the chaplet, the litany, and the novena, I asked her to let me look it over. As I was glancing through it, Jesus gave me to know interiorly, already there are many souls who have been drawn to my love by this image. My mercy acts in souls through this work. I learned that many souls had experienced God's grace. I learned that Mother Superior would not have quite a heavy cross to bear, together with physical suffering, but that it would not last long. It occurred to me to take my medicine, not by the spoonful, but just a little at a time, because it was expensive. Instantly, I heard a voice. My daughter, I do not like such conduct. Accept with gratitude everything I give you to the superiors, and in this way you will please me more. When Sister Dominic died at about one o'clock in the night, she came to me and gave me to know that she was dead. I prayed fervently for her. In the morning, the sisters told me that she was no longer alive, and I replied that I knew because she had visited me. The sister in infirmarian, Sister Chrysostom, asked me to help dress her, and then when I was alone with her, the Lord gave me to know that she was still suffering in purgatory. I redoubled my prayers for her. However, despite the zeal with which I always pray for our deceased sisters, I got mixed up as regards the days, and instead of offering three days of prayer, as the rule directs us to do, by mistake I offered only two days. On the fourth day, she gave me to know that I still owed her prayers, and that she was in need of them. I immediately formed the intention of offering the whole day for her, 
And not just that day, but much more, as love of neighbor dictated to me. Because Sister Dominic, after her death, gave the appearance of looking so well, some sisters said that perhaps she was only in a coma, and one of the sisters suggested to me that we ought to go and put a mirror to her mouth to see if it would mist, because it would if she were alive. I said all right, and we did as we said, but the mirror did not mist, although it seemed to us as if it had. Nevertheless, the Lord gave me to know how much this had displeased him, and I was severely admonished never to act against my inner convictions. I humbled myself profoundly before the Lord and asked his pardon. I see a certain priest, probably Father Sepoko, from whom God loves greatly, but whom Satan hates terribly, because he is leading many souls to a high degree of sanctity and has regard only for God's glory. But I keep asking God that his patience with those who constantly oppose him might not run out. Where Satan himself can do no harm, he uses people. November 19th. After communion today, Jesus told me how much he desires to come to human hearts. I desire to unite myself with human souls. My great delight is to unite myself with souls. Know, my daughter, that when I come to a human heart in Holy Communion, my hands are full of all kinds of graces which I want to give to the soul. But souls do not even pay any attention to me. They leave me to myself and busy themselves with other things. Oh, how sad I am that souls do not recognize love. They treat me as a dead object. I answer, Jesus, O oh, treasure of my heart, the only object of my love and entire delight of my soul. I want to adore you in my heart as you are adored on the throne of your eternal glory. My love wants to make up to you, at least in part, for the coldness of so great a number of souls. Jesus, behold my heart, which is for you a dwelling place to which no one else has entry. You alone repose in it as in a beautiful garden. O oh my Jesus, farewell. I must go already to take up my tasks, but I will prove my love for you with sacrifice, neither neglecting nor letting any chance for practicing it slip by. When I left the chapel, Mother Superior Irene said to me, You will not go to the catechetical lecture, sister, but, I, but will remain on duty. Very well, Jesus. I thus had your father today very many opportunities for sacrifice. I omitted none, owing to the strength of spirit I drew from Holy Communion. There are times in life when a soul is in such a state that it does not seem to understand human speech. Everything tires it, and nothing but ardent prayer will put it at ease. In fervent prayer, the soul finds relief, and even if it wanted explanation from creatures, these would only make it more restless. During one time of prayer, I learned how pleasing to God was the soul of Father Andres. He is a true child of God. It is rare that divine sonship shines forth so clearly in a soul, and this because he has a special devotion to the Mother of God. Oh my Jesus, although I have such very strong impulsions, I am to act on them slowly, and is only in order not to spoil your work with my haste. Oh my Jesus, you give me to know your mysteries, and you want me to transmit them to other souls. Soon, now it will be possible for me to act. At the moment of apparent absolute destruction, my mission, now no longer hindered by anything, will begin. Such is the will of God in this, and it will not change, although many persons oppose it. Nothing will change God's will. I see Father Sepoko, how his mind is busily occupied and working in God's cause in order to present the wishes of God to the officials of the church. As a result of his efforts, a new light will shine in the church of God for the consolation of souls. Although for the present his soul is filled with bitterness, as though that were to be the reward for his efforts in the cause of the Lord, this will not, however, be the case. I see his joy, which nothing will diminish. God will grant him some of this joy, already here on earth. I have never before come upon such great faithfulness to God as distinguishes in this soul. During supper in the refectory today, I felt God's gaze in the depths of my heart. Such a vivid presence pervaded my soul that, for a while, I had no idea where I was. The sweet presence of God kept filling my soul, and at times I could not understand what the sisters were saying to me. All the good that is in me is due to Holy Communion. 
I owe everything to it. I feel that this holy fire has transformed me completely. Oh, how happy I am to be a dwelling place for you, O oh Lord. My heart is a temple in which you dwell continually. J.M.J.